Okay, so perhaps I can start uh, introducing the speaker. Francesco is uh, one of the most prominent mathematicians uh, in the world. He started uh, his uh, career in Florence, which is not only the cradle of the Renaissance, it's also the cradle of the calculus of variations. <laughs> Now he's at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, and uh, oh, he also worked <laughs> for a short period for the ICTP in Trieste. And so I have great expectation of his talk because I have to say I attended several talks by Francesco and they were always inspiring and amusing. So he will talk today about the symmetry of plateau surfaces and the moving place method with singularities. Okay, so thanks Enrico for the very, very generous introduction <laughs> and uh, uh, for the invitation to give this talk. Thanks also to Daniel for uh, helping with the um, organization of the talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a joint work with uh, uh, Jacob Bernstein. Uh, from the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And uh, uh, so, what is this about? It's about symmetry of proto surfaces and the moving planes method with singularities, uh, which I think it's an interesting uh, topic because, as you will see, it mixes a problem of uh, uh, physical, uh, clear physical motivation with a field that is geometric measure theory that is not definitely mainstream analysis with uh, one of the most well-known and appreciated techniques uh, in the analysis of partial differential equations, that is the moving planes method. So I have somehow, uh, uh, in creating this project together with Jacob, uh, we have somehow the uh, hope that uh, uh, this kind of um, uh, analysis that we're presenting uh, can be inspiring for kind of situating ideas and methods uh, from these different uh, settings from one to another. So what this is about? Uh, let me start with the <coughs> physical motivation. So minimal surfaces in R3 are the standard model used in uh, uh, the physical literature and for the modeling of soap films at equilibrium. And are of course, uh, a, one of the most studied mathematical objects out there, right? And uh, so um, the mismatch between the th mathematical theory that is mainly uh, devoted to the study of smooth immersions and the experiments is, however, quite clear. Uh, indeed, uh, this is not just a, a matter of uh, kind of crazy, strange singularities that mathematicians may like to attach to these surfaces. It's actually a matter of uh, um, the fact that minimal surfaces have singularities that the classical theory of minimal surfaces doesn't consider. So, here you see, I have, I have, uh, uh, I have uh, uh, take, I've taken this picture. Uh, so actually this paper you see down here is my paper with Jacob. And what you see here, it's a, a, a minimal surfaces that creates a sort of Y singularity where the uh, red arrow is pointing, right? So this is a near this point, uh, there is no minimal immersion that describes what we are observing. So somehow there is this mismatch that we would like to understand. And the mismatch experimentally has been described by physicists since the time of uh, uh, Joseph Plateau, who uh, postulated that soap films uh, should be modeled by, yes, minimal surfaces, so surfaces with zero mean curvature, but such surfaces will be joined along lines of Y points. So these are the Y points uh, that are either closed. So for example, you may have a circle of Y points, uh, structure like that, or end up in T points. So T points are uh, points where you will see better pictures in a moment, where somehow you have a point singularity and you have four lines of Y points converging to a single T point. So these are the plateau laws. And, uh, um, and therefore our idea would be in a nutshell the following. Why not uh, trying to understand the theory of minimal surfaces, the theory of smooth minimal immersions, and understand its results in these more appropriate context of surfaces that are uh, locally regular and then analytic and minimal or locally diffeomorphic to y or t points. So somehow this sort of semi-classical uh, uh, notion of minimal surface that we have called minimal plateau surface. So let me, uh, before I get to the definition, 
let me uh, show you uh, the um, let me give you a bit of uh, um, a bit of uh, context questions let's say so the question is to what extent the classical theory of minimal surfaces uh, may be generalized to minimal plateau surfaces and what new conclusions can be drawn and in order to study this question i will take uh, a model uh, problem a case study if you want for uh, for, an, for approaching this question and my case study will be showing rigidity theorem for catenoids so showing theorem says the following if you have a minimal surface in r3 spanning two parallel circles centered on the same axis then your surface is going to have rotational symmetry about the axis. In particular, since it has rotational symmetry, it must either be a pair of disks or a stable catenoid or an unstable catenoid, where both, this, both these catenoids have zero mean curvature, but actually this uh, fatter catenoid here is going to have positive second variation, where this catenoid here will have negative second variation. So there is uh, some perturbation of the, of the unstable catenoid that decreases the area of the stable, unstable catenoid uh, <clears throat> to second order. So, Schoen's theorem is a famous result in the theory of minimal surfaces that is proved by the moving planes method um, and uh, dates back to the 80s. So, our question is okay, what happens if rather than minimal surfaces, we do this with minimal plateau surfaces, right? So, what new conclusions can be drawn? And the answer is that. Um, well, you should see at least two more surfaces. So together with the smooth equality cases already identified by Sean, we should see the stable and the unstable singular catenoids. So singular catenoids are, are in a sense similar to the standard smooth catenoids from the theory of minimal immersions, but you have two catenoidal necks that meet along a circle. So this is a circle of Y points. So this surface has a lot of singularities, a full circle of singularities. And then this circle of singularities is filled by soap. Okay? And you can do that both in the stable configuration where you get something a bit fatter, let's say, and both in this uh, uh, skinnier configuration where you have two uh, kind of thin catenoidal necks that are joined by a floating disk of soap. So the picture, let me go back a few slides. The object that I was trying to construct uh, in my kitchen when I took this picture, you see, is indeed something very similar to these singular catenoids. You see, there are like two catenoidal necks and they meet along a circular uh, set of Y points. Actually, you see that in this example, since I've crashed a bit the upper uh, boundary wireframe, the Y points arrive up to the boundary wireframe, creating a boundary singularity. So this will be an interesting remark for what follows. So that there can be actually boundary singularities in, in this class of minimal surface, plateau surfaces. Okay, so let me go back to this question of Schoen, result of Schoen, and our conjecture about what it could look like uh, in this setting. Now, the problem is that, uh, well, the problem, the interesting question is, can we prove this? I mean, this is the natural conjecture, but is it true? Can we prove it? And what happens uh, if one tries to apply the moving method in a situation where surfaces are potentially singular and we know that singular surfaces actually will will not be excluded by the moving plane method so now there must if the moving planes method can be using this problem uh, singular surfaces will be uh, in the set of equality cases of possibilities for our problem so the class of minimal plateau surfaces uh, this is the definition so let's say that you have an open set uh, u in r3 and uh, um, you have a closed subset of U, and you say that it's a minimal plateau surface. If for every point uh, in your surface sigma, you can find the ball around the point, everything is well contained inside the open set U, and you look in this ball, and inside this ball, you are C1 alpha, uh, C1 alpha diffeomorphic to something with a diffeo that at the center of the ball is uh, a rotation. Okay, so. I don't want, I want these diffeos to keep the geometric, uh, 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 to map isometrically the ambient space at the point, because I want to preserve the tangent cones at that point. So what are the models? So what are the possible images of my surface? Well, I will, first of all, we will have what you expect to have in the case of classical minimal surfaces, right? So either interior points, so that locally around P, you are diffeomorphic to a plane, or, 
boundary points locally around P, my surface sigma is diffeomorphic to a half plane H. So the first class of points are called the interior points, of course, and the second class of points are called the boundary points. And the interior points have zero mean curvature. All right. So it's a classical surface with zero mean curvature. So if I close here my definition, this is the definition of minimal surface with boundary inside the open set omega uh, u. Sorry, inside the open set u. It's nothing. Uh, it's the usual definition of minimal surface with boundary inside of an open set. But we want to do minimal protosurfaces. So we allow for other two possibilities near the generic point. So my open set u, my surface sigma, my generic point p. And then I allow for a third possibility. Around p, I am diffeomorphic to a y cone that is obtained by joining three half spaces, sorry, three half planes along the line at angles that are equal, so 120 degree angles. So these are the y points. Or I may have a t point. A t point is a point locally around p. Uh, we are diffeomorphic to t. t is the cone spanned by the edges of a regular tetrahedron. Uh, with respect to the center of the tetrahedron. So it consists of six planar sectors bounded by four lines. These four lines all meet at the vertex of the tetrahedron. And you see the requirement that my diffeomorphism is an isometry at the center of the ball means that uh, when I apply the diffeo to sigma, uh, sigma is really going to blow up either y or t at the y and t points. And I quote, interior points, boundary points, y points, and t points by taking these subscript. OK, so it's a, you see, this is nothing com really com complex. You see, uh, very folds, currents, sets of finite perimeter, these are complex classes of uh, generalized, where you can define generalized notions of minimal surfaces. This is pretty simple. At the end of the day, I'm just adding the possibility of being isomorphic either to a y or to a t cone that, OK, are not the plane and the half plane, but are actually quite specific objects, right? So it's not uh, such a crazy class. And in a sense, this is what Plateau, that's a mathematical way of, of expressing what Plateau was talking about. Now, let's take our minimal surface. So which is the composition in interior boundary y and t points, and uh, with the interior points that have zero mean cover. What can we say? So first of all, if there are no y and t points, we're just back to classical minimal surfaces with boundary. When there are no t point, we talk about y minimal surfaces. So surfaces that have only possible y singularities. Here in the picture, it's an example from a paper by Jim Taylor. And, uh, and then there could be, uh, of course, t points. So here in the picture, you see an example. You take uh, a cubic frame, and this is the kind of minimal surface you observe. You know. So you see here you have a line of white points, a line of white points, a line of white points. And here, these four are T points. Okay, they are points where you are locally isometric to a tetrahedron, diffeomorphic to the tetrahedron, but with a, something that is an isometry at the point. Okay, and these things are real. So this is, a, for example, it's, you see, I mean, this is a picture in Gene Taylor's paper. It's just a picture, it's a drawing. So this is a real sub film. So these objects are definitely something that you can observe, right? So in a sense, it's a bit of a shame that the mathematical theory is not equipped to describe what happens to them. Now, uh, actually, it's not exactly true that the mathemat mathematicians haven't worked on these kinds of questions. Uh, for example, let me mention in this, uh, in this slide uh, two very important results. So first of all, you can characterize, you can find this class of minimal causal surfaces through area minimization, as much as minimal surfaces can be constructed through area minimization. So this is a famous result of uh, uh, Gene Taylor and Frederick Almgren. So if you have a closed set inside an open set, and you know that your closed set is minimizing H2, the two-dimensional Hausdorff measures, with respect to each and every Lipschitz deformation of your set, okay, then uh, your set is a minimal plateau surface in you with empty bound. So, this is the content of this paper of Gene Taylor that I, that I mentioned uh, a moment ago. And uh, moreover, sets satisfying this particular minimality property can be constructed uh, in, by means of the calculus of variations with the prescribed boundary data. This has been done uh, through the minimization of the Hausdorff, two-dimensional Hausdorff measure. 
So this has been done by Harrison and Pugh, uh, Guy David, uh, Camillo De Lellis, Francesco Giraldin and myself, and others in a series of papers, uh, some of recent papers, I would say, last uh, 10 years or 12 years, uh, where we construct a variational theory uh, so that the minimizers are going to be in this class of minimal protosurface. So we know that they exist physically, we know that we can, can construct them mathematically, but somehow there is a huge theory of, there's, there's a huge theory, a huge series of results about minimal surfaces that we may try to adapt to this class of objects. And it would be interesting to see because this is a physical class of objects. Now, uh, there is a point uh, about my definition of minimal protosurface. For, and when I say it's physical, yes, it's physical, but it's in a sense, it's also a bit optimistic because the boundary behavior of my minimal plateau surfaces is regularity. So what I'm prescribing, you see, the minimal plateau surfaces we're talking about near the boundary wire, they will be diffeomorphic to a half plane, period. There can be anything else. But if I go back uh, uh, a few slides into my talk, uh, not this one, yes, here, I don't know if you can see it, but, oh, you can see it because I can zoom, okay? You see, these are the Y points. Uh, you see the Y points, once I arrive here, this is a boundary singularity. So it's not true that uh, soap films near the boundary wire are always diffeomorphic to half spaces, as it would be at this point here, at this point here. At, so these are all points where I'm locally diffeomorphic to a half plane, but, there could also be a point where locally I have a more complex behavior. And those points uh, are not in my definition. It is not, uh, uh, and I, we are excluding them for a reason. You will see what, what is the reason in, uh, uh, when we go uh, a bit more uh, deeper into the story, okay? But this is just to say that there is actually an even more complex theory of minimal pressure surfaces that we may like to consider uh, and that we are not touching yet. So, unfortunately, we will not be able to prove Schoen's theorem even in this uh, class of minimal plateau surfaces where the boundary behavior is good. Our proof, uh, since it is based on the moving planes method, will require us to use a notion of uh, orientability for minimal plateau surfaces, which is a bit strange because you see, it's a wide surface, right? If I take a wide surface, there is no way of defining a normal to the surface that is continuous because you see, I arrive here and something bad happened because if I continue, if I go for, with continuity, it's going to be like that here, but then maybe here I should turn like that or I should turn like that, it's unclear, right? So how do you orient a minimal plateau surface? So we had to come up with a definition. This is what we have found. The minimal plateau surface in an open set defines what we have called a cell structure if, um, okay, there are no boundary points. So there is the open set. So there are no boundary points inside the open set. So all the boundary points are at the boundary of the open set U. And if U minus sigma consists of a finitely many open connected components, so the open connected components in the picture that just disappear were U1, U2, U3. So in this case, three connected components, but that's not enough. We need a bit more. We need that. If you take a point in sigma, there exists a sufficiently small radius such that the ball, the small ball center that we intersect with this connected set remain connected. And this is something that could be really an hypothesis. So let me show you two examples. So here it's an example of a minimal plateau surface that has a cell structure in U. So this is a catenoid. So the open set U will be the slab, uh, so two, the regions of R3 uh, between two planes, x3 equal one and x3 equal to minus one. And sigma is the catenoid. And you see the, this catenoid divides the, the slab into two regions. Remember that this is a three dimensional picture. Eh? There are the interior of the catenoid and the exterior of the catenoid. And this is a cell structure because you see, I take a point in sigma and I can draw a sufficiently small ball such that my ball intersected U1 is connected and my ball intersects the U2 is connected. And this property holds at every point in sigma. So the cell structure assumption holds. While here, however, I have a stranger surface. And also if I do a Y catenoid, same story, it will have the same property. But if I do here, you see something in between, something that looks like a Y catenoid, on, but then it has another leg 
and the other leg looks like a regular catenoid. And then this is not okay because you see, if I take the point P to be here, so this thing in R3 gives me just two components, the interior U1, and there is also an exterior U2 that somehow travels around the two legs of this pair of pants. Now, if I draw a ball centered at this point, you see that U1 that was connected as a region in R3 becomes disconnected by my ball because U1 intersected the ball as two components. So that's not something defining a cell structure. Now, do we have, do we know, me and Jacob, a minimal surface sigma that looks like that? No, we don't, okay? We don't know how to construct it. So we are not 100% sure that you can construct a, a minimal plateau surface that violates the cell structure hypothesis. We don't know, okay? But something like that could be topologically, let's say. Topologically, it's very easy to construct something that violates this cell structure. Now, can you do that while keeping the minimality? It's less clear. The minimality, I mean the zero mean curvature condition. Now, now you know all the assumptions of my theorem. So I can go to the theorem itself. So the, 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 our main theorem says the following. So we have a, a minimal plateau surface compact in R3 with the following properties. So the surface is, uh, defines a cell structure in the slab X3 less than one. So it's contained in the slab and its boundary is contained in the boundary of the slab. That is the half, the, sorry, that is the space is X3 equal one and X3 equal to minus one. And what, what are the boundary points of sigma? The boundary points of sigma are just, you have a, a, a open set omega in X3 equal zero and the boundary is the boundary of omega cross one and the boundary of omega cross minus one. So you just take the boundary of this curve and you put it at height one and at height minus one. So these two curves are the boundary of my minimal plateau surface. And the set omega here, defining this curve of boundary of omega is bounded open and convex. That's a key assumption, okay? So the convexity of the boundary data. So we have and actually the fact that it's the same boundary data, data at height x3 equal one and at height x3 equal to minus one. So if we have a minimal plateau surface bounded by two convex curves that are just a translation one of the other, okay? Containing these two parallel half planes and our surface defines a cell structure, then all sorts of conclusion follows. So first of all, we can prove that our minimal plateau surface is a symmetric by reflection with respect to the plane x3 equals zero. So whatever it does upwards, it does the same on the bottom part of the slab. Second, the top part, so if you do sigma intersected x3 non-negative, so if you look at this top part of your surface, that's equal to the closure of the graph of a function. So if this is omega, here I have a subset of omega, omega prime, okay? And there is a function defined over this set omega prime so that whatever sigma does on the top half of the slab is the graph of this function u over omega prime. So omega prime, for example, here it's an annulus, you see, in the case of the catenoid, it would be an annulus. And you see that u is of class C1, okay? But since I am using this closure, you see, I can do something like uh, the vertical catenoid, it will be a C1 function on this open annulus, the DSC1 function. Then the derivative becomes plus infinity on the interior boundary circle, which is okay if I, if I ask C1 because sigma is just the closure of that, right? So it's okay. I have this positive C1 function defined in something that could be an annulus, but actually I can prove it's an annulus, right? Because I can prove that sigma intersected with X3 equals zero. So the section of my sigma is going to be the boundary of this subset of omega, omega prime where the graph is defined interior to the section omega. So if the section omega was a circle, say, then this thing will be some, um, some uh, topological circle inside uh, these uh, larger circles. And finally, uh, in the latter case, okay, so in the case when, um, in the case where there is an non-trivial boundary, so, in case where this thing, right, it's either empty. So if, it, if it's empty, it's like this is, this is the, the full thing and probably my surface is just the two parallel disks. But if this is non-trivial, 
I either have that the derivative of u is plus infinity of this interior boundary, and this is corresponds to the case of the regular catenoid that we are just parameterizing in this direction. So we see a, a derivative equal to plus infinity, or we see a constant, you see, constant normal condition, the derivative is square root of three, because what we are observing is, uh, what we are observing is indeed the, the uh, y catenoid, okay? But the interesting thing is that this theorem doesn't require the curves, uh, the curve boundary of omega to be a circle. It's just a convex curve. So somehow we are saying that uh, even if you don't, are not bounded by a pair of circles, right, topologically you look like uh, either a catenoid, either a pair of uh, flat surfaces or some sort of catenoid because you are, you are a graph that is repeated by symmetry, right, by reflection, or you are somehow a sort uh, of singular catenoid because you have a smooth surface, a smooth graph that attaches at height x3 equals zero with a constant angle and then it's repeated upwards. So, and then necessarily you have to fill this uh, bottom, this uh, mid uh, section with uh, the surface. That's it. So this is the result. Uh, of course, if omega is a disc, then uh, we can say that, okay, then sigma is either a pair of disc or a pair of catenoids or a pair of singular catenoids. Now, uh, let me, so I think the statement uh, is clear, or, or we can discuss it uh, more later, but I think the statement should be, I mean, uh, uh, it's maybe complicated to look at it because there's a lot of uh, uh, things written on the, on the slide, but at the end of the day, I think that the description uh, it's, uh, of the statement uh, should have uh, suggested that actually it's a simple geometric statement in a sense. We're saying that a minimal proto surface is bounded by two convex curves that are parallel and the same, the same convex curve at height one and at height minus one is essentially the convex boundary version of a singular catenoid or of a catenoid of all the right? So now, Schoen's proof. So Schoen's proof, uh, it's interesting, it's a moving plane method in the horizontal direction. So what Schoen says, same assumptions as us, but in this case, he has a minimal surface. And so the orientability condition, the cell structure condition is easier, it's trivial. So in this case, you see, you have this thing. So initial reflection uh, of the surface, like in the classical moving planes method. So you start, you move the plane horizontally and you start reflecting your uh, minimal surface and you get a reflected surface. So you have these boundary circles that in Schoen's theorem don't need to have the same radius. And you keep moving until you find a first touching uh, uh, time to zero in the reflection process and first touching point. Now, for example, when this interior touching point, uh, uh, so where this, in, where this touching point happens in the interior, so some of the slabs are up here, you see, but the first time to zero where there is a touching condition, the reflection of sigma, touch sigma itself at an interior point inside the slab. So when this happens, you see near this point, since I didn't, I, I was never touching earlier, I have a sort of containment of uh, the surfaces, right? And this containment is important because it tells me that with respect to some um, hyper plane, I can see both the, the, the touched part of sigma and the reflected part of sigma as graphs of minimal surfaces. So they're both graphs of minimal uh, surfaces. Sorry, they're, sort, they're both minimal graphs near the point P0. And the functions u and u0 are ordered. So one is less than the other and they touch at a point. So strong maximum principle, they locally agree, okay? Which means that, so they are equal one to the other, which means that actually sigma has the local reflection symmetry here in the ball, they are the same thing. And therefore, once they are locally the same by unique continuation, sigma must be symmetric until you can propagate the information, okay? This is just the case where they touch the interior. Of course, you, the moving planes method may stop at the boundary so maybe this is how sigma looks and then my reflection is going to touch up here. So this could be sigma prime P0, they touch up here. But in this case, I can show that they, uh, they do so in a parallel way and then I can apply the op boundary lemma uh, that is a boundary version of the strong maximum principle to conclude that they locally agree and then again by unique continuation they react. So 
uh, you repeat this in every horizontal direction and you prove that your minimal surface is rotationally symmetric and then it's an ODE to show that it's the catenoid or it's just a disc, okay? A pair of discs. Uh, actually, there is a recent result by Pio of 20, uh, 2012 where it shows that a variant of showing theorem where rather than being bounded by two circles, on one plane, you are bounded by a circle. And on the other plane, you have constant contact angle. So I don't know what kind of boundary I have down here. It would be crazy, but I know that the contact angle is constant, okay? And then uh, Pio can prove that you are again a catenoid or uh, a circle and there is no contact region here. So either you are a circle and there is nothing here, this is empty, or if this is non empty, you are a catenoid. The proof is morally the same strategy of showing, it's just that you have one more case in the moving plane method, that is the case where your reflected surface is touching at this free boundary down here. But again, you're assuming that you have constant angle, therefore when you touch, you can apply up. So, um, so what is the interesting of this result of PO for us is that in order to solve the case of circles, and show that we have singular catenoids or catenoids or, or discs in our setting. We just need to prove the uh, we just need to prove the symmetry by reflection with respect to the mid plane. So we just need to prove. You see, the first uh, three statements in my uh, main theorem. Then the case of the disc is followed by Pierre's argument because what we are claiming in the first three three claims of our theorem is that. Uh, we, we have uh, on the top part of the slab, the graph of a function, on the bottom part of the slab, the same graph reflected, and then in the midsection, either constant angle or angle equal to plus infinity. Both, both are compatible with the PO's assumption, and, and so we get the radial symmetry then by the classical moving planes method. So whatever is special of this problem for minimal plateau surfaces happens at the level of showing the reflection by symmetry with respect to the vertical direction, okay? And that's what now we're going to do. So uh, let me explain the main, main ideas of the proof, okay? So as, as explained, we are going to use the moving planes method now from the vertical direction, because all we care about, so we have these two convex curves uh, that are actually the same convex curve here and there. And what we want to prove is that this object is uh, uh, symmetric by reflection with respect to the plane x3 equals zero. So we start reflecting with respect to a moving plane coming from, uh, from the um, plus infinity vertical, and we start reflecting, right? And we would like to prove that our surface is symmetric by reflection. Now, so you see, my regularity assumption here comes very handy because here at the plane x3 equal one, right? I know that I have my convex curve, and I also know that I, I'm regular, right? Because my boundary points, at my boundary points, I am regular. So I know that if this is x3, x3 equal one, and these are the boundary points, locally, I look like a half plane. So I start with the most possible regular picture I can imagine, okay? That's very important. Without this, we don't know how to make the moving planes method start. So for the example that I've shown of possible boundary singularities, this is a problem, okay? So the proof doesn't even start. but that's why we're assuming boundary regularity. Now, with boundary regularity, we can at least get started with the moving planes method. Okay. Uh, let me also, maybe before I, I say how the moving planes method goes on, let me mention you this example. Because there are physical singularities, like the one that I've shown in the first slide of the talk. But there are also mathematical singularities that could be uh, interesting to look at. So you see, here in this picture, I have done a singular catenoid, uh, that is this one here. So I have a singular catenoid, and then I have drawn in green a standard catenoid. And then you see, this is not going to be a minimal plateau surface because the standard catenoid, the sigma one, and the singular catenoid, sigma two, they intersect along the circle and they don't do that at y points, right? So that's not a minimal surface. However, there is a famous, famous example in the theory of minimal surfaces where you can take a plane, a catenoid, so they intersect along the, uh, along the circle. And then what you can do 
you can remove the circular of singularities. So you can construct a minimal surface that outside of a compact set is exactly the catenoid and exactly the plane. And it's just the first from those things near this circle. And what happens so near the circle, you continuously change between the catenoid and the plane. So it's a, a sort of alternating saddles, saddles geometry. Uh, that it's, I mean, I, I don't have a picture here. So it's called the, I think it's called the Costa surface or the, the singularization of the plane with the catenoid. So I, what we could imagine possible is that you see here locally, I have a plane because it's the interior circle of the singular catenoid and the catenoid. So definitely Costa knows how to singularize this in a minimal surface if these examples are unbounded, right? Now they are bounded, however. So I don't know, we don't know if it can be done and it should be possible to do that okay so by changing a bit uh, the surface is everywhere so it should be possible to do that but uh, we don't know so this is just to say that besides the physical singularity there could be unphysical singularity like a pair of planes at the boundary that generates examples that are definitely then not to be with the cell structure assumption, I mean, they're going to have a lot of problems uh, topologically. So they're ne never going to be in our theorem, not only for the boundary problem. But just to say that this boundary assumption contains something that could be worth further investigation. So, idea of proof. So, you see, uh, what I was saying, right? So, since at the boundary point, first boundary point, we are regular, so we start uh, reflecting. So, my surface here just looks like a nice uh, surface with boundary. And there are necessarily just two cells, U1 and U0. And if I reflect, right, the reflection of the cell U0 is contained again in U0. So initially, you see, I have the property that if I take U0 above my position T and I reflect with respect to position T, whatever I get below the reflection below X3 less than T, below the reflection plane, is still in U0. Is this picture honest? It's very simple. That's crucial because as you know, the moving planes method rests upon the idea of inclusion, propagating the inclusions. So if we don't have that, we go nowhere. And here it's a point to show that this thing is propagated where this cell structure assumption that I explained is crucial. Without it, we don't really don't know how to make the method work. So somehow, um, somehow these, uh, uh, these two assumptions are really needed for exploring what the moving planes method can say in this problem, which doesn't mean that the stronger conclusion we expect are not going to be true, are going to, are, sorry, uh, are going to be false. They could be true. Probably you cannot access those theorems just by the moving planes method. Maybe you need something more. Okay, so as you have seen before, right, the moving planes method is based on unique continuation, maximum principles. So what form could these kind of statements take in our setting. So for example, we will need a unique continuation theorem for minimal plateau surfaces. So this could take uh, this form. Say that we have uh, a connected uh, minimal plateau surface sigma one inside an open set on U without boundary points. And there is an open set U V, sorry, an open set V here, bounded by a classical minimal surface. And you know that uh, these, uh, uh, yes, these, there is a classical minimal surface that essentially is the boundary of this set V inside you. So if you know that either, so either sigma one and sigma two are disjoint, but if they are not disjoint and sigma one never enters in the region V, so you see sigma one, it's a minimal plateau surface, so it may have a lot of singularities. It touches the sigma two, but it never enters inside the region V bounded by sigma two. If this is the case, then they must agree. So sigma one is actually contained in sigma two, okay? So a minimal plateau surface essentially cannot lie on one side of a, of a classical minimal surface. If, they, if there is this uh, touching condition, one side touching condition, then they must agree. This is the unique version of the unique continuation principle in this setting, which works, I would say, pretty similarly to the standard unique continuation principle. Uh, more interesting is uh, uh, the adaptation of the principle of removable singularities that we will need. Because you see, when you, when you go with these reflections, right, 
uh, you will find yourself in situation like the one described uh, down here. So, so you will have situations where you have uh, just localized, just think of a ball, and you know that there are a minimal plateau surface outside of the, of the center of the ball. This you know, without boundary points. In the ball minus the center of the ball. At the center of the ball, you know that the complexity of your surface cannot be too much because the area of your surface inside of the ball compared to pi of square, the area of a circle of radius rho, of a disk of radius rho, is uh, asymptotically as rho goes to zero, strictly less than two. Why two? Because two is the number associated uh, to say sort of touching singularities or branching singularities. So it's sort of a critical threshold for a lot of uh, uh, density two is for example, what you see, yes, I, I, I would say with touching singularities where, where somehow you, you blow up a plane with multiplicity two. So we need to be slightly below that because slightly below that, we can exclude all sorts of complex possibilities and end up in the world of planes, white points, and points. That's essentially how this works. So, you know that you are, you are a minimal plateau surface away from the origin. You have this density assumption at the origin, and that in the top half of the ball, you are a nice graph. So, you are a graph with respect to some subset of omega prime. Then you would like to know what can happen below on the bottom part. So in the bottom part can be completely crazy or must be nice. And the answer is that you are symmetric by reflection, okay? So in the bottom part, so the, the answer is that under this assumption, crucial, the, uh, this, uh, this density assumption, um, sigma is a minimal process surface in the ball BR0. Now, if zero belongs to the surface, then it's either an inferior point or a white point, and if it's a Y point, the spine of the Y point, so that the line of singularities is inside the hyperplane that you use to define this geometry. Okay? So these are removable singularities looks like in our context. And finally, uh, there is a, a last ingredient, three main geometric ingredients that we have called the propagation of, of infinitesimal symmetries. So Again, our, our minimal surface, minimal plateau surface in, X, in the slab without boundary points. And we consider a situation where we have the plane X triple zero, and there is a component, a sigma plus of our surface, component of sigma intersected X three positive, which is a classical minimal surface in the upper of this. So we are essentially assuming that we never met a singularity up to this point, okay? So somehow the previous principle was useful to show that we could never have the singularity before the x3 equals zero height. Now at x3 equals zero, there could be a singularity. Okay. Assume to know that sigma plus is bounding, okay, some open set V with the property that if you reflect V below, we reflect B below, okay, the reflection doesn't touch sigma. So the reflection of this thing never, so sigma could be something here, you see, could be very complicated with a lot of Y points and T points, but it doesn't touch the reflection of the set V bounded by sigma plus on the top part of the thing. And finally, assume, and this is the infinitesimal symmetry, assume that the tangent plane to sigma at the point P here, or an X3 equals zero, it's a symmetric tangent plane, different from the horizontal tangent plane. So, it could be either a vertical plane, which means that sigma plus is arriving here vertically, or it could be a Y point, but then if it's a Y point, it cannot be this Y point. It's either this Y point, or it's this Y, oh, sorry, this Y point, you see, or it's a tetrahedral singularity, but it's centered so that it's symmetric with respect to reflection, okay? So, which is impossible, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So it cannot, it cannot already, you know, it cannot be a T point because T points cannot never have this. So the conclusion is that if you have this infinitesimal symmetry and this inclusion property up to this X3 equals zero, then, then you are actually, the reflection of sigma plus is contained in sigma. So this thing here is also part of sigma. It's not just bounding something contained in sigma. 
is also part of sigma. And this propagation of, in, of infinitesimal symmetry is the key step in our argument to, to get the global symmetry by reflection of uh, this theory, of these uh, surfaces. And it's based on the previous two ingredients I have shown you. Okay, so uh, very, okay, let me, let me just do that. So I will just read this question since my time is essentially over. So there are several questions. So this paper is just, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of starting the analysis of these possible uh, uh, minimal path of surfaces, but there is definitely much more to be uh, said and understood. So the first question is, uh, are there minimal plot surfaces as labs that are bounded by simple curves and do not have the cell structure? Okay, so is this somehow this example? Can I do something that looks like a Y catenoid here and then looks like a standard catenoid, right? And then goes all the way up to the slab. And here it's bounded by two simple curves. Can something like this be a minimal plot surface? You have an idea. Would be a nice example, I think. Then, Question, can one produce unstable minimal plotter surfaces by being max methods? So can one do the min max theory in the context of minimal plotter surfaces? Um, other question, given two convex boundary curves, can we describe the space of minimal plotter surfaces bounded by, that are topologically singular catenoids? So for example, is there always one stable and one, one unstable minimal plotter surface as in the case that we have described here or not? And here, the point is that it's two convex boundary curves, because in our case, it's one convex curve on the top plane, and it's another convex curve on the bottom plane, but this curve and this curve are the same curve. They're just translated. So what happens if instead, here I have one convex curve, and here I have another convex curve, okay? So do I still get uh, the same space with five elements, uh, two st uh, three stable, two unstable, with this kind of thing, right? or there are more complex possibilities. All these, all these kind of results for minimal surfaces are well understood, okay? What the, the question is what happens? How do you prove them for this physical, physical class of minimal plot surfaces? And uh, fourth, can one characterize singular catenoids by area minimization? So can one prove that the singular catenoids are area minimizing? There are situations where we expect them to be area minimizing, in the context of this horizon cube theory as refrained by um, Camillo De Lellis, Francesco Giraldini and myself, for example, we extended a bit the kind of boundary conditions you can consider. So we are able to formulate problems, plateau problems where the candidate minimizer is evidently singular catenoid, but how do you prove that? Uh, this is open. And uh, I think that there are also a fifth, a sixth and a seventh question, but uh, I guess that, uh, that's more than enough for the talk. So thanks for your attention. <laughs> thanks a lot to Francesco. Are there any questions? Well, in the meantime, I have a trivial question, probably. The shear result for minimizing surfaces uh, is trivial, right? Because you can just uh, do a symmetry and intersect and, union, and take the union of the objects. And so if, the, uh, if you have a minimizing surface, you don't need even the moving plane. Am I right? I agree with you, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This, uh... As usual, I mean, these problems uh, for uh, global minimizers are a bit easier, you know, because uh, uh, there are several, uh, uh, yes. I, I don't know if there are examples of um, PDEs. I, I think this would be interesting to, um, to find example of uh, PDEs where uh, you expect some canonical singularity to happen. I don't know. For example, I don't know if there are some obstacle problems where, or free boundary problems uh, where one can expect uh, uh, certain types of singularity to, to be observed and then one can try to make the moving planes method work. Because what, what, what in a sense, from a more technical viewpoint, since we are mathematicians, right? So uh, could be interesting is, seems interesting of this paper is that, uh, uh, 
we are in a situation where a priori there are singularity, singularities, which seems bad for the moving planes method. We apply the moving planes method and the singularity don't disappear. They're still there, okay? There is a paper of, um, by Brian White, Robert Asselhofer and the Ho, where they do this kind of thing. So they have a situation for the, for the mean curvature floor where they have possibly singularities. They apply the moving planes method and at the end of the proof, they discover that everything was moving. So you're left in a sense with the flavor that uh, there were, I mean, the, you didn't apply the moving planes with singularities. Here you are applying moving planes method with singularities because there are singularities at the end of the story. So there could be, I think, interesting examples also at the level of PDEs, uh, where not, not, not artificial ones, but really basic PD problems, where this kind of uh, uh, approach could uh, produce results that are new in the sense that uh, uh, people I mean, were excluding the singularities rather than uh, uh, allowing them to stay until the conclusion of the theorem. You know? So I think this could be interesting. Another thing is how much you use of dimension three. Would this work in any dimension? No, we use a lot. Result. How much does it use of dimension three? No, shown nothing. No, shown is true in every dimension. Shown is uh, the problem here is that, uh, for example, if I go back uh, uh, to um, to the heart, to the result uh, of uh, 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 Taylor and Almgren, right? So Taylor and Almgren proved that these uh, local Lipschitz, local minimizers with respect to Lipschitz deformations of the area in R three are plotted surfaces. Now, the, nobody knows, as a matter of fact, a similar characterization for minimizers of uh, Hn in Rn plus one with respect to local Lipschitz deformation. You don't even get started because we don't have a characterization of uh, the possible uh, um, uh, cones. So at the, at the very basis of the theory of uh, Angren and Taylor, it's a result that goes back to Plateau himself, to an assistant of Plateau that uh, excluded all the possible geodesic nets that don't uh, give rise to area minimizing cones. And then it just ends up with the Y and the T cone. But there is nothing like that in R4 or in R5 and so on. So we don't even know, in a sense, what is the right uh, definition of minimal plateau surface in R4 or in R5. Actually, for, as a matter of fact, uh, we were, at least we weren't be able to find anything like plateau's uh, laws uh, concerning uh, boundary singularities. So here, you see, in, in my homemade experiment, here I have, uh, I, I definitely have here a boundary singularity. This is a line of singular points that arrive to the boundary, right? And okay, here nearby, my surface will blow up the intersection of a Y cone with a half space. So that's clearly a possible uh, boundary cone. But what are the other possible boundary cones for minimal plateau surfaces? I mean, are generically every kind of intersection with Y and T cones is possible? Are there more? So what is the right assumption you see at the level of boundary regularity? Should we allow double planes? Like uh, near the boundary, I have two, like for example, it could be a disc uh, and the catenoid, uh, and then I feel uh, the top and the bottom disc. This would blow up near the boundary wire, right? Two planes with different angles. So this seems kind of silly examples, uh, but this one, this one here, it's more geometric, it's more rich. So we don't know the, we don't have proofs of the characterization of the possible minimizing cones. So to be honest, I, we don't even know what could be the right formulation of the problem outside of the specific setting we have considered. Do you know something about uh, the angle prescription at the boundary, whether your uh, arc singularity uh, have a prescribed angle with the, uh, with the iron uh, wire? No, that, that's uh, exactly, this is what's unclear. I mean, it seems very flexible. So somehow it seems, I mean, playing uh, at home with uh, soap films, uh, it would seem that uh, vaguely, right? Uh, you can take a Y cone and you can intersect it with a boundary, with a half space. Without so, any prescription. At least for what I could see, you know, I mean, what I'm not, uh, 
<laughs> These are not really scientific experiments, so it's more like playing around with soap. Uh, but for example, can uh, a T point be sitting at the boundary? This is, uh, I don't know, much less clear to me. I, 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 you see my point? Because the, a T point means that I am able to make uh, four lines converge to a boundary point. Mm, I, I would say no, I mean, kind of intuitively, but. Uh, uh, I mean, I would like some better understanding of why this is possible. There's some prescription on the, on the iron wire, right? Because otherwise you can just add a piece of iron that goes directly to the intersection of plane, right? Exactly, exactly. And then there are all these, exactly, sort of fake examples that are not really convincing, right? Because it seems you are cheating. So, yeah, I, 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 and so that's why I think, uh, uh, I, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, assuming that at the boundary they behave like how spaces wasn't uh, such a bad assumption because, to be honest, we are not even sure what the assumption should be. <laughs> I mean, what the more general assumption should be. But it's definitely a rich structure and uh, I don't think there is much work done by mathematicians, at least, to understand these things. As far as I can say, even by physicists. I wonder if there are any questions. Okay. Okay, so if there are no further questions, I think we can meet uh, the coffee break. You should have received an invitation. So okay. thanks again, Francesco, for uh, this beautiful talk, which uh, clearly overcame even my very high expectations. <laughs> uh, hopefully we can meet soon uh, once the pandemic is over. <laughs> if you stop spreading the virus in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't moved much from my home, so it's not my fault. <laughs> As <laughs> much I can tell you. <laughs> okay, so okay. we'll raise you at the coffee break. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone.